really sure about this. Oh, okay. I thought it, yeah, fine. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna stay there at the end until he starts, then I'm gonna leave and then come back, okay? Oh, no, that's so, super sorry about that. I normally hey, don't, okay. know, yeah, don't, I don't that. do that. Yeah. Don't normally don't do that. Catch your first name. Carla. 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 Okay. Yeah. All right, Carla. Uh, yeah. Thanks for setting I'll me up. No, yeah. no problem. Uh, and do you want to switch the lights then when you do that? Uh, before I leave, I'll do it. So I, I will let you totally set. No. Yeah. I just. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're good. And just what is it? You need to project. Yeah. To yeah. share the screen. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, we just have an EGA connection. Okay. 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 And then the color you switch on with all my grid Um, she didn't. Is that is that in the? Uh, yeah, it's just on the top. Uh, just make sure you put that whenever you're ready, and the little green light right here will come on. Uh, does anyone yep. need one yep. of this? Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll be back before the end. Okay. So I will take care of everything. Okay, well, I'll come back anyway just to make sure. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, thank you, Dorothy. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming out. Um, yeah, it's been an incredible journey that's still still going, really. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, excited to be here for so many reasons. You know, launching a new NS NSF project. That, you know, I'll tell you a, a little bit about at the end. Um, but I'll sort of share with you my journey uh, through chemical and sequence space, uh, as I like to, to frame it. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's kept me really, uh, really excited uh, over the years and, and taken me some, some pretty interesting places, I'll say. Um, so the taste of ginger, um, you know, if you enjoy, especially if you enjoy uh, uh, Chinese cooking, um, very flavorful. Uh, Zingiberian is, is that signature um, terpene that, uh, that gives us that, uh, that fond flavor. Um, if you're a beetle, you know, you might be attracted um, as a pollinator uh, to, to a plant uh, um, 
by a, a, another terpene. Um, certainly, plants might produce a terpene like capsidiol in order to defend itself against uh, the late uh, blight. Um, so plants in, in all organisms, animals even, make terpenes for a variety of reasons, oftentimes uh, to, to mediate important communication events um, that stitch together these uh, ecological um, uh, structures. And so just to share some work uh, that a lot of people contributed to, some, some of my friends in Yena, um, a really fascinating example of, of the role of, of terpenes in the indirect defense of, of plants. Um, and so you'll see a, a maize plant here that is, is, is being fed on by uh, lepidopterans. Um, and uh, that certainly, you know, you know the, the maize plant takes notice of that and produces terpenes in response, like alpha bergamotene, for example. And uh, these happen to be strong attractants, these, these terpenes, to, to wasps, which are the natural predators of lepidopterans. And they home in on those those chemical signals, and uh, and, and 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 prey on on the lepidopterans. So, really, an enemy of an enemy is a friend. And uh, chemical communication here kind of closes a circuit in biology between different organisms. So it's uh, really quite fascinating uh, to consider. And uh, so, like I said, I you know, I think of this as a language, a living language, uh, chemical communication, and terpenes are, are a critical part of that, um, given their chemical complexity. So I'm gonna take you through and show you at a structural level um, how these terpenes came, come to be, you know, some of the mechanisms that, that give rise to them. Critically, cyclization, which is really the, the essence of what a terpene synthase um, does. Um, and uh, certainly take you to the, to the level of the enzyme that creates these, these compounds, sort of the mouthpiece of this, this language system. Um, but really, uh, you know, I'm interested in how this communication changes over large time scales, and that naturally takes one uh, to, to consider uh, protein evolution. And, uh, and in particular, uh, you know, I'm really fascinated by the origins of the terpene cyclization mechanism and how the, how the enzymes uh, acquired that ability. Um, and one of the key uh, messages here um, is about the interconnectedness of biology. This interdependence gives rise to epistasis, which can have very dramatic effects on how accessible new functions are to evolving enzymes. Um, and finally, just by characterizing as many variants as possible, which which are really small in comparison to, you know, what could potentially exist. Um, through some of my experiences in my work and in future work, um, really keen to build these fitness landscapes to have a look at this relationship between sequence uh, and function, um, and to and, and and to to find new ways to visualize and understand how how enzymes evolve. And so sesquiterpenes is, will be the topic of discussion today. There's a lot of different classes of terpenes, but this is my favorite. Um, <laughs> um, so I told you about uh, chemical communication already. Uh, these are pretty small compounds. Um, the hydrocarbons themselves are two, 204, um, um, but uh, pretty, pretty small and volatile, so they're great for communication. They can travel some distance in the air. If you consider sesquiterpenes, um, there's at least 300 stereochemically distinct structures that you can derive from a single linear substrate, farnesyl pyrophosphate, farnesyl diphosphate. Um, pretty remarkable. Um, and it was recognized some time ago by David Kane, actually, that, uh, that this is a, a, a achieved um, through an organization, a folding of the substrate in such a manner that it, it primes the, the reaction, which is an intramolecular cyclization reaction that's all spatially organized very, uh, very uh, or early by the enzyme in order to facilitate some of these cyclization mechanisms. And so, I, you know, as a, as a structural biologist, I'd be remiss without showing some kind of rotating molecule. Um, and uh, this is FPP here and just a, a model of one of the many 
conformations that it can adopt. You can imagine this can twist and bend into all sorts of shapes. And those shapes have some correspondence to these cyclic products ultimately. And part of my interest, uh, you know, very early on and, and continuing interest is to try to decode this, uh, how this, uh, you know, this spatial encoding of the cyclization uh, reaction happens. Um, and so to, to kind of paint the picture here of, of some of the questions I'm really interested in, you have this one uh, universal substrate, a, a conserved protein structure, in diverse products. The terpene synthase uh, is the key player here that diversifies over time to, to give rise to new activities which, which give us these, these different terpenes that we see and that'll be the focus of, of the next part here. And uh, you know when I started my postdoc in, in Joe Noel's lab at, at Saul, uh, this was a little bit after they had solved the first protein structure of a terpene synthase tobacco 5 epiaristolacine synthase, or TIOS, as I'll refer to it. Um, it makes one terpene really well. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a specialist. Um, and, uh, but, it, you know, this, this gave us a model to consider how terpene synthases uh, work and how the, the fold uh, really makes this, this uh, chemistry happen. Of course, before we had any structure, we knew that there were these motifs in these proteins just by looking at sequences. Uh, this DDXXD motif, uh, as it's called, um, is responsible for, for binding metals, in this case magnesium, and those help to coordinate uh, with the pyrophosphate of FPP and uh, weaken the carbon-oxygen bond uh, as a part of the catalytic mechanism, which is a carbon-oxygen lyase. So what these enzymes do effectively is cut a carbon-oxygen bond. Um, but the amazing thing that happens after that is, uh, is cyclization. And that's the, the reaction of the isoprenoid chain with itself. And that's mediated through these allylic carbocations that um, are pretty special. Um, you have these pi electrons that can, can shift around and, and relocalize the positive charge in ways that enable this uh, this reaction to occur and, and give rise to many different rearrangements. Um, but one thing that, you know, the, the, so these motifs are absolutely conserved, but uh, one thing that uh, was, was pretty obvious is that the residues in the active site that, that might bind to uh, the substrate where this chemistry is happening um, are quite variable. And so learning crystallography and using some uh, inner substrate analogs. One of my goals was to reconstruct the reaction, try to identify a discrete fold of the, of the substrate in the active site, um, and, and through that, try to reconstruct the reaction mechanism, um, spatially, that is. So um, having a, a starting fold here um, you know, gave me some, some basis to then uh, consider various transitions and transitions through these carbocation intermediates, which um, we can't really isolate um, in any real sense. Although with quantum chemistry, we can certainly uh, calculate um, these structures uh, really accurately. And from you know, organic chemistry, we know about different rearrangements and we can reason what the key intermediates are likely to be. And also the end products give you some indication of what intermediates might, might be relevant to, the, to, to their formation. Um, so there's working back in the reaction history to, to come into a final product, uh, which you see here in the active site, the final uh, neutral hydrocarbon that's created, as well as pyrophosphate, an often neglected product of the enzyme, but it, it's pretty useful in some ways. I'll, I'll share with you uh, here later. And so let's take a look at the cyclization reaction in a little more detail in the, of sesquiterpene synthases. After this carbo, um, um, carbon oxygen bond is cleaved, you have a, an initial carbocation that can cyclize immediately. Um, and these cyclic carbocations can further rearrange into a whole range of other products. Um, but there's an interesting aspect to the mechanism in some of these enzymes. This pyrophosphate can rebind. But remember I showed you the allylic carbocation, you know, with the, you know, the cationic charge at C3, the pyrophosphate can just rebond to that. And the, the, the value of that or the significance is that now, now this bond can rotate 
so that you go from a trans to a cis configuration. And if that's reionized, now you have a cisoid cat carbocation, which enables a whole range of other cyclization reactions, including the 1,6 cyclization, which is geometrically impossible from the all trans cation. So uh, these are some of the gymnastics that a sesquiterpene synthase might have to undergo in order to access some of these, these other cyclic uh, products, which derive from some of these different cyclization uh, intermediates. Now, very early on at Joe's lab, I was interested in, in the products and reconstructing the reaction mechanisms using GC mass spec and identifying minor products in TIOS. Um, that, that enabled you know, confirmation of, of some of the proposed reaction intermediates um, in support of evidence of their existence um, because all, all roads lead to Rome here uh, would be the expression in that there's these common carbocation intermediates that um, are very important to consider um, in, in reconstructing these, these reactions. Um, and in an evolutionary sense, you know, related organisms, they diverge from one another as they produce different chemical defense systems. And uh, often these compounds, capsidiol, which I showed you earlier, is a very potent uh, um, uh, phytochemical, phytoalexin, as it's called, uh, which uh, inhibits the growth of phytophthora and festins, um, the blight. Um, so pepper is very effective at making capsidiol. Potato took a fork in the road here, unfortunately, for the potato and for the Irish. I think that if we had a more robust potato, you know, that, that might have affected, you know, some mass migrations. Um, but zooming out and considering this in the context of plants, I've taken the, the, the TPSA group that, uh, uh, that, that Jörg Bollman had described a number of years ago and annotated this with some of the cyclic products that we see in, in, some, in some plants. And that's really kind of been the focal point of my work looking at uh, plant TPSs and how they've diverged, particularly in the solanaceous plants. And sort of the framework that, that I'll, I'll lay out here, and this is a diagram that I'll come back to um, uh, over and over, is this, this paradigm for how proteins evolve. And the, just the notion that there's a progenitor enzyme, some kind of generalist, um, that through um, evolutionary forces is shaped to give rise to many specialist enzymes. Um, in our case, you know, specialists that make particular uh, cyclic terpene products. And a really nice uh, piece of work out of Jake Easling's lab, um, you know, demonstrated how you could take this uh, promiscuous enzyme, uh, gamma humulene synthase, a terpene synthase that makes 52 different products in its, its spectrum. And through random saturation mutagenesis, um, Yoseo was able to identify many different specialists and, and some plasticity residues in the active site that uh, alter product specificity. Um, so really inspiring bit of work. And one of the conclusions was that there's this incremental additive effect of mutations. Now granted, these are random mutations which may not represent natural variation. Um, but for my, my interest, I was focusing on, on how evolution happens in the plants and maybe restricting sequence space in some sense to consider uh, just you know, the natural variation and how that impacts um, cyclization. And um, I showed you some reaction mechanisms that connect these two products, premispiridine with epiaristolacaine. Uh, so one of my interests was in piecing together what the key changes might have, might have been that, that gave rise to these distinct activities in the modern enzymes. Um, and so this built on some collaborations that, you know, were in place uh, really, be, you know, at the time that, and maybe before I joined Joe's lab, um, and, uh, you know, it's well known that there's TPS orthologs um, in the solanaceous uh, plant family, um, TIOS and HPS. These are the tobacco enzymes. They make 5 epi Um And these are the potato um, and, uh, um, and tomato uh, orthologs that, that create the uh, premnospiridine. And there's nine positions that are most critical, nine positions that, are, that uh, Brian Greenhagen found that, you know, if you mutate in TIOS, you turn it into HPS. 
and I, I tunneled backwards, and, and so it works both ways. So that gave us a nice experimental system to work with. And if you consider the mechanism again, I'll show you this in sort of another way. You have FPP converted into this common carbocation intermediate, which can cyclize in a number of different ways, either to, to the 5 epi stolokine or the premnospiridine, or this 4 epi amophiline, which is uh, sort of, you know, in the, in the middle of the road product. And um, there's not really huge energy differences between some of these different cyclization, you know, options. So the enzyme has to, has to, to you know, really exercise some subtle control um, over these cyclizations. So this gave me something to work with and consider, and uh, particularly some of the sequence space here um, that exists if one considers the combinations of those nine substitutions and what the biochemical properties of those enzymes are. Um, and so that's, that's one, one aspect of the work is just creating this enzyme lineage uh, and then expressing and purifying these proteins, biochemically characterizing them, um, in particular by GCMS to, to look at their terpene products, which uh, defines what I just call um, chemical space. And these are just those positions in the linear sequence here. Of course, the ribbon diagram that I showed you before. In a surface of the active site, it's, it's like you're looking at a, at a catcher's mitt, but you can't see you know, where the ball is. But the point is, is to highlight that there's a couple of uh, substitutions that are in the active site. But when you go outside of the active site, you see this constellation of, of other substitutions that are in the outer tiers that, that actually you know, have some, some influence on the chemical reaction. And so uh, in doing a, a GCMS analysis of all these mutants that, that I created, um, I, uh, I basically treated it like a sequence alignment, the GC chromatogram. And so what, I've, what I'm highlighting are, you know, this is 5 epir stolokine, you know, premdespiridine, 4 epir amophiline, or the sum of all other products. I just considered essentially four products here. Um, the three main ones, and then just lumped everything else together and derived a, a chemical distance, which is just a, a Euclidean distance um, based on uh, the chemical output as measured by the GCMS, uh, sum of least uh, squares here. Um, so just, you know, a way to express distance and to create some scatter plots. Uh, this is just a 3D scatter plot of, of chemical space. And each one of these dots is a mutant in the library and where they fit in that space. So um, the things that are immediately apparent from this is that, um, that there's, there's a fair number of them in the middle here, a lot of promiscuous en enzymes, a lot of generalists um, in the mix. Um, but uh, certainly um, there's some very interesting parts of, of the sequence space where depending on what combination of mutations you have, a single additional mutation, uh, with a single additional mutation, you can access another function, a very specific function, uh, in a single step. So there's some places in sequence space where, uh, where the enzymes are rapidly evolvable. Um, so that, I found, was uh, one of the most fascinating observations uh, from just looking at this, this large collection of mutants. And that really got me, th you know, thinking about epistasis and... Um, you know, the context effects or the interdependence of different substitutions and how, how they alter um, uh, evolution. Um, and so that's, that's going to take me across the pond uh, to the UK. So that kind of summed up my uh, postdoctoral work with Joe, uh, focused on solanaceous plants. And, uh, you know, Chris Lim, uh, the director at JIC, you know, um, you know, brought me over to, to UK, made, you know, made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And, you know, I joined the, the John Innes Center and, and, and switched to uh, Asteraceae plants to, to continue uh, my interest in uh, the evolution of these enzymes. Uh, alpha bisabolol, if you like chamomile tea, that's a, a very distinctive uh, flavor there. Uh, also has a lot of important medicinal applications. Um, artemisinin, um, you know, very prominent. Uh, sesquiterpene, uh, of course, uh, anti-malarial, um, very well known, um, all produced by Asteraceae plants, uh, flowering land plants. So um, as you'll see, this is really a ripe system to study um, 
evolution and, and the emergence of cyclization, which at the time I thought this was maybe one of the more central questions uh, to address uh, is the origins of the cyclization reaction and, it, and, and the possibility of, cycl of, a, of a cyclase arising from a linear product producing enzyme like E-beta farnesine synthase or BFS as I'll call it. Um, and the notion that maybe there's a BFS progenitor which would be mechanistically the simplest kind of terpene synthase you could imagine. It just makes, you know, there's no cyclization here at all. Um, and perhaps that could have preceded other more specialists in that family. And so really the question again becomes what natural substitutions activate uh, the cyclization reaction. And so back to this diagram, of course I showed you um, some key aspects of the cyclization reaction, but cyclization doesn't always happen. Of course, in the case of compounds like uh, E-beta farnesine, um, you have an immediate uh, quenching of this reaction before any cyclization can happen at all. Um, and uh, quite different from what might transpire, you know, were this to persist. So this is the question, um, naturally, um, cyclize or, or not. And that's uh, um, really uh, what uh, uh, Artemisia annua uh, gave us, uh, you know, an ideal model system to study. Um, like many plants, it has numerous terpene synthases, E-beta farnesine synthase being one of them, a morphodiene, morphodiene synthase another. Um, E-beta farnesine, uh, important in ecology, it's an aphid alarm pheromone, it's very well studied um, in that way. And artemisinin I introduced um, earlier, a uh, very potent uh, anti-malarial drug. Of course, these, uh, these are related terpene synthases, about 50% identity. Um, but certainly different uh, biochemical functions. And when you look at BFS, it's a very simple enzyme, or a minimalist, as is, is, uh, is, is Melissa and I would call it, um, whereas uh, amorphodiene synthase, we would call that a complex enzyme. I mean, just consider the number of, of uh, you know, uh, rearrangements that this enzyme has to, uh, um, has to accommodate in order to achieve amorphodiene and high yields. And so I'm going to share some work that really Melissa's project and, you know, in my time during uh, her time at the, the John Ennis Center, which uh, yeah, explored this, this basic question about the emergence of cyclization. So you know, our hypothesis, quite simple. Um, there's got to be some kind of cyclization motif, um, or maybe several, which enables the biosynthesis of cyclic terpenes. And, um, and to a first approximation, that would be in the active site, in the active site vicinity. Um, so just, you know, building some models uh, and asking the question, what's within the six angstrom radius of the substrate? Um, you know, Melissa and I identified um, 24 positions that um, are different between BFS and ADS, which makes it a, dwarf, a morphodiene there. So... Um, so in considering this problem, it's a matter of making uh, in, or incorporating ADS substitutions into BFS and that's asking which ones activate cyclization. So here's, here's the, uh, the haystack that we had to deal with uh, very early on. And so in order to construct these libraries, um, we use, you know, I, at the time we thought about just synthesizing the genes, but, you know, I developed... Um, uh, protein engineering technique called structure-based combinatorial protein engineering and as a graduate student. Um, and uh, we, we simply applied it here, which uh, amounts to just taking this, uh, the coding regions of the, of the gene, just slicing it into three pieces. So there's this deconstruction of the gene into its coding elements, diversification, you know, by incorporating mutations, in this case, ADS substitutions. And then amplifying up these, these different fragments and recombining them to reassemble the full length construct. So this was inspired by uh, Gregor Mendel and, and his breeding scheme um, and uh, you know, applied directly here to uh, investigate the emergence of cyclization. And so this is an overview of the process that I'll, I'll walk through and come back to. That's the six, six angstrom sphere in the middle. And, and, you know, and these are the gene fragments that uh, Melissa broke uh, BFS into. And uh, 
then incorporated muta a variety of mutations into each of these fragments at varying intensities um, in, in a grid-like way. So you could sort of mix and match and, and create you know, libraries of various collections. In discrete collections, it, it made the screening a little bit easier. We could dial in how many mutants were in a given pool, um, how many mutations were in those collection, each gene in a given collection. And uh, of, of the possible number of constructs we could have made, we estimate that there's at least 27,000. Um, granted, we didn't sequence all those, but that's, that's the complexity of, of the library that we created, just sampling the combinatorial uh, complexity that, that one could make conceivably. Um, but as I'll show you, I mean, you know, screening resources you know, sort of limit how much sequence space you can examine biochemically, so we've got to be practical here. Um, but just a, a closer look at how Melissa would be designing these libraries, you know, there's these three fragments, and within each fragment, you know, there are these zones that correspond to these active site uh, positions. And uh, Melissa simply created uh, collections of mutants of, of low, medium, and high intensity um, in those and uh, um, composed these as discrete collections so that she could put them together in a very precise way. Um, and so in terms of biochemically characterizing uh, uh, the library, uh, what we did is simply purified the proteins in and adapted this, uh, the vial assay, which I developed when I was in Joe's lab, uh, which is a simple GC mass spec assay where you do the enzyme assay in aqueous phase. The enzyme and the substrate, they're, they're soluble, you know. Um, but the hydrocarbon product is not. In fact, it's, uh, it's uh, um, extracted into this hexane layer, which we can sample with the GC and directly inject uh, for analysis. Um, but I mentioned pyrophosphate before, and it, it turns out that it's pretty handy because we can use that for kinetics analysis. So this gives us product specificity, what terpenes are being made. This gives us catalytic efficiency. And Maria did a fantastic job of adapting this malachite green assay to quantifying uh, liberated pyrophosphate um, over time, which enables to, us to clock these enzymes and, and get their efficiencies. Um, so back to the overview here, uh, we have the genotype and the phenotype, and the phenotype composed of the product specificity um, and uh, catalytic efficiency. And uh, we did three rounds of screening and did some library deconvolution. Another way to say that would be back crossing. Um, and uh, through this work, characterized uh, 745 mutants. So um, hats off to Melissa. That was. That was a lot of hard work, but you know, 96 well plates and you know, um, make that sort of thing tractable. Here's what the early days looked like in the first plate that we screened. Um, yeah, there was a whole lot of nothing on the on the GC. In fact, we found that all the enzymes were either dead or the ones that were still alive. They just produced a single product, beta farnesine. Um, that was a little bit troubling. I mean, we knew this was a high risk project. <laughs> um, but, you know, we were delighted to see um, some cyclases, you know, in our, in our second 96 well plate. In fact, uh, we found a few of those cyclases, and after Melissa sequenced them, uh, she found a common mutation that they had, the Y402L uh, mutation. And this, this gave rise to an enzyme that produces 15 different cyclic products. 75% uh, of the total products are cyclic. So this Single mutation just activates cyclization. And importantly, uh, it's still very catalytically robust. It has features that are consistent with what you'd find in a native enzyme. Not too much of a hit com to, the, to the wild type uh, you know, efficiency. And this really fits with a paradigm of going from a specialist maybe to a generalist with kind of a weak you know, of impact on function and maybe the, the possibility of going from a generalist then to a specialist, uh, as, you know, uh, as we'll see. Um, and so, of course, we're immediately interested in, you know, understanding what the, you know, how the Y402L mutant gave rise to cyclization. And uh, the simplest explanation relates to this isomerization reaction that I showed you earlier. And the role of Y402L is to unlock the cyclization reaction. In particular, 
is to remove this blockade here, this, this, this bulky aromatic residue um, that, that, that enables uh, this capture at C3 in a rotation um, of the sigma bond and ionization to this cisoid carbocation which gives rise to all the products that we see out of the gateway mutant. They all are derived from the 1,6 cyclization. So really the key is to enable this isomerization and, and, and that leads to, to the cyclic products that we, uh, that we see. And so um, I should say that we were, you know, I should uh, give praise to William Bates and, um, you know, the first director of the John Innes Center. Um, and notably, he uh, rediscovered Mendel's work um, and uh, turned that into uh, modern plant breeding, essentially. Um, coined the term genetics. I uh, thought that was a, you know, a handy term for a promising new science, field science. Uh, but he also coined this term epistasis, um, which is a, a non-Mendelian pattern of, in, of, of inheritance where there's, you know, essentially there's an interdependence between multiple alleles that give rise to uh, some of the patterns of inheritance uh, that, uh, that he noted in, in some, some breeding experiments. And so we're doing this work in, ba in, in, in the Bateson building and, uh, you know, seeing epistasis and the, uh, uh, the emergence of cyclization, as I'll show you. And um, it, it was really quite special for us. And, um, you know, it, and this is really illustrated by our rounds of, of screening where uh, Melissa first identified this gateway mutation that unlock cyclization. And then what Melissa did is then screened uh, the library, reassorted the scope library in a way that, you know, she could look for variation while holding the Y402L mutant constant and found uh, a second site suppressor mutation uh, that essentially, you know, eliminated cyclization altogether. And screening in that background, uh, Melissa found a third residue, this Y430A, uh, substitution that reactivates cyclization. Uh, so the essence of epistasis, this, this, this interaction with and this, this interdependence of these residue substitutions in, in controlling uh, the cyclization reaction. And this is sort of my reframing of what we, what we did, you know, going through uh, a few generations of breeding and, and back crossing. And, uh, you know, that enables us to put together a couple Punnett squares, right, where um, you know, if you look in the background of the wild type 4, 430 position, 467 is, it will suppress cyclization um, wh whether or not you have this gateway mutation, right? Um, but when you have help here from 430, then, you know, it becomes immune to that suppressive effect. Um, and so that, uh, despite having a single mutation to unlock cyclization, there's an interdependence among these different positions. An enemy of an enemy is your friend. So we see this on different scales of organization and it's, uh, you know, it's uh, quite prevalent in biology. So this is what I call an epistatic network, you know, a series of residues that, that collude with each other and that depend on one another for determining the, uh, um, the phenotype or the function of the enzyme. And so what was kind of interesting to us is the physical basis of this, which, um, you know, I think even looking at its static structure, the fact that 402, Y402 is influenced by 467 and 430, um, they're not directly connected to one another. Um, 430 and 467 are certainly interacting residues. It's not easy to understand how a mutation here would affect a, a you know, a position here, but uh, clearly this, this suggests that, suggests the role of the substrate is a key player in this, in connecting this, this circuit here. Um, and so that's, that's, our, that's my speculative model that, uh, that, that the substrate itself contributes to these effects. And so we wanted to quantify that uh, a little more precisely and uh, Detender in the, in the group did some, uh, some analysis um, uh, mathematically on this to, to, to give us some indication of how strong these forces were. And, uh, you know, the goal was to, to, to visualize this in, in some way or another. And visualize it against the notion of, you know, if, if these effects are purely additive and you consider going from, you know, the wild type to this, this triple mutant, you'd have this perfect, you know, geometrical structure. You know, these, these effects are just are independent of one another. Um, but, 
you know, the reality, if you calculate these uh, um, sort of constants and, and plot things out, you see that epistasis really deforms this, this perfect geometry in rather significant ways. And this is a, gl a glimpse at this abstract sort of reality of the fitness landscape and, and how, you know, there, there are certain parts of it that are really rugged um, and where enzyme function can change very dramatically, very rapidly. And so um, throughout this work, we put together, um, and, and Melissa characterized any number of, of different um, um, enzymes, and it's really quite fascinating. Um, in some of the, the rounds of screening, we'd see you know, activation of suppression and suppression of, of, of cyclization, because you would incorporate the 467 in, in, in the cyclases and, and try to reactivate them. So we just saw this toggling of, of these, these activities. Um, 46 cyclase enzymes in all 52 linear product producers. Um, a fair number of them have, have reasonable catalytic properties that, that are consistent with what you see in a native enzyme. Um, so they represent uh, what would be you know, reasonable intermediates to, to speculate. Um, and uh, among this, this group of enzymes, we found three specialists. Um, we found a, a beta bisabiline synthase. That's this alpha bergamotine synthase and this alpha bisabilol. Um, and uh, in these three products and, and other minor products, kind of the interesting thing is when you look at other Asteraceae cyclases, we find specialists that make some of these products in high yield. So it seems like this gate, like the BFS background has that capacity to uh, uh, give rise to a lot of these different specific products um, with the, the right collection of supporting mutations. So interesting experiment. Okay, what about ADS? I make the same, the, the reciprocal mutation in that enzyme. Uh, you would expect that would, uh, in a, that, that would lead to a linear product producer, right? Um, it turns out it doesn't, it doesn't impact cyclization whatsoever, nor do any of the other um, residues in that uh, uh, epistatic network. Um, they all have the effect of just reducing the catalytic activity of ADS. So that was a little bit puzzling maybe on the surface. Um, but in thinking about it, um, I think there's, there's some reasonable explanations one might uh, evoke here or, or invoke. And that's that accumulating mutations following this gateway mutation um, seek to minimize the, the interatomic distances of reacting carbocations to maximize cyclization to amorphodiene. And so ADS over time, um, going from BFS, maybe BOSS is an intermediate, which I'll, ex I'll explain, to ADS, you would expect if, the, if this product, making this product in high yield is favored uh, by nature and selective pressures are active, acting on it, then you want to constrain that substrate fold uh, progressively and, and pre-organize that um, in, in order to efficiently make that product. So that seems like a reasonable explanation um, to me at, at this point. And, uh, and so sort of the, uh, the, the, the speculative model I have for diversification of terpene synthases in, uh, and Asteraceae terpene synthases is that one of these branches, a BFS branch, um, along that path, uh, there was a gateway mutation which um, activated cyclization and with further mutations led to, to many specialist activities in that over time, in, in the accumulating, accumulation of supporting uh, residue substitutions, um, these enzymes sort of painted themselves into a corner in, in essence. And uh, you know, the, the role of that position 402 is now different because the protein background is actually different. So again, that's the forces of epistasis um, adding you know, the importance of context um, to, to the role of a residue in, in uh, affecting catalysis. Um, but one experiment that we thought would be interesting is to see, okay, can we activate cyclization in other BFS enzymes? And, you know, chamomile uh, has a BFS that's, that's related. And certainly when you mutate these positions, yeah, the gateway mutation activates cyclization. And we can suppress that with the second site suppressor. These are pretty, pretty similar uh, proteins, 94% identical, of course. Um, 
But you know, what, one thing we found interesting was you know, to go to a more distantly related uh, terpene synthase, uh, the, the, a BFS from, from the yuzu plant of the Rutaceae family, 51% um, identical. Um, and you know, oddly enough, the, the, the suppressor of cyclization is now the activator. So um, I won't sh show you the other results, the, you know, the other um, mutations, but the roles have shifted you know, as the background shifts. Um, but they all play a role in, in, in controlling the, the activation of cyclization. And this time in a, a very drastic you know, reversal of, 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 uh, of roles here. Um, so that, again, drives home the, the role of, of epistasis. And back to, to my paradigm chart here, and to summarize some of the work, um, of course, uh, beta farnesine synthase, uh, Melissa has been able to show uh, that you know, cyclization is, is really in reach and that it's quite reasonable to speculate that that you know, is a progenitor of, of some sort, uh, giving rise to many specialist functions that we see in, in, in the Asteraceae plants, Artemisia annua and others. Um, but uh, we became interested in one particular specialist, and that's alpha bisabolol, um, and uh, how one might transition from BFS to BOS uh, is the name of that, you know, alpha bisabolol synthase. And so uh, really our choice for doing this, one, we had a specialist enzyme in, in the mix, but two, we found that a lot of the mutants, they produced some a bit of alpha bisabolol. So, um, so we picked the one that, that was the best producer, produced 84% alpha bisabolol, um, and asked what mutations gave rise to that. We know the gateway mutation is important for cyclization, but there's a whole collection, of, there's four additional mutations in that, that particular variant. Um, and so we wanted to deconvolute that or essentially do a back cross and, and see what, uh, what's the essential variation that gives rise to alpha bisabolol specificity and what the effects of, of different combinations of these mutations are. And so as a matter of just applying scope in that way or, or sieve essentially, and uh, Melissa was able to find rather quickly that uh, um, a single additional mutation after the gateway mutation gives us an alpha bisabolol synthase. So it's a two-step process, very close, uh, very accessible function for an evolving BFS. And again, we wanted to look at um, the influence of epistasis, uh, which is qu quite dramatic here as well. Um, if you simply calculate it and, and look at where these uh, different variants are in, in this space, and fitness here is defined as the amount of alpha bisabolol that the enzyme would make. And you see sort of a stratification here. Um, but both 402 and 429 show a high positive epistasis for uh, driving alpha bisabolol specificity. And there's a couple different pathways you could explore going through this, this space. One is you know, activation of cyclization through the gateway mutation and then specialization. Um, or you essentially maintain a beta farnesine synthase-like activity by accumulating 429, and then cyclization is, is, is switched on. And, uh, you know, it seems like the simple explanation here is that uh, 402 controls the magnitude of cyclization, whereas 429 controls the magnitude of specificity. And uh, what I'm showing you here is, is the basis for a much more detailed biophysical characterization um, that uh, is, a, is a paper that uh, Alex, Alex and I uh, are um, hoping to, to publish soon, one that's under review that, that uh, describes this in much more intimate detail and, and the couplings between these different substitutions um, as they uh, um, exist throughout the protein structure. So, um, but I'll focus more on, on the sequence aspects here and go back to phylogeny and consider, okay, alpha bisabolol synthase, beta farnesine synthase, very closely related. Um, so naturally, you, you would expect that, yeah, a, an alpha bisabolol synthase, you know, may, may be in this mutant library to begin with. Um, but we went back to the codon table and, and tried to reason through viable paths that would get you uh, from Y to L um, and T to G, uh, 429. 
And so just looking at, at this tree here, we can eliminate an S as, as, as being likely given the absence of that, you know, in other, uh, in other Asteraceae TPSs. Um, so we just considered a simplified landscape here. And what, this, what I'm showing you here is a transition from beta farnesine beta synthase uh, going from F to, to L at 402, and then transitioning um, from T to, to A to G. Um, and there's a lot of different ways one can consider doing this, um, making this transition. Um, but if you consider the kinetics of these enzymes, there's really only one viable path uh, where you have active, robust active enzymes um, you know, that, that take you through these intermediate steps a specialist uh, to generalist to a specialist um, at the end of it. And so this is our most uh, our simplest or most parsimonious uh, uh, explanation of, of, of how um, beta or alpha bisabolol synthase derived from a BFS uh, progenitor. And so when you look at the active site models, um, these residues are, are in contact and, and can influence, influence each other quite strongly. And, um, you know, this, this reaction involves a water capture, which ultimately uh, comes from these, these, these metal ions, uh, we believe. Um, but it's no wonder that, these, that there's an interdependency between these, these two positions and in, in reshaping the specificity of, of, uh, of these enzymes. And so just for the last brief minute, I'd like to introduce a, a new direction here, taking us into uh, the insect world. And uh, it's really an important reason that I'm here. Um, and uh, of course, you know, all the, while, all the time doing this work, it was, you know, pretty well understood that it, you know, only plants and microbes can make terpenes. It, you know, insects use them, maybe they hoard them, they collect them from plants. Uh, and, or maybe they have some, you know, bacteria that, that manufacture them and they can emit them at their, uh, at their time of choosing. Um, but, uh, you know, Dorothea made, you know, really fantastic discovery of, of terpene synthases, bonafide terpene synthases in insects uh, that give rise to uh, cyclic terpenes as a part, an important part of their chemical communication. And... Uh, Really, the goal of, of our project is to consider the emergence of cyclization uh, in animals and uh, put together what we, I think, consider a, a Rosetta Stone of sorts to, to, to try to do some decoding here um, to make these relationships between uh, the changes in the sequence and the appearance of, of a chemical language and, and maybe its influence on, on the ecological uh, systems where this is playing out. Um, so really excited about this and, and excited about this for so many reasons. At the, the, the level of, of metabolism, if you consider the origins of, of terpenes and terpene synthases, um, back when the first crystal structure was available of a plant terpene synthesis, it was recognized that, you know, it looked very similar to the IDS uh, enzymes. They share the same fold, this alpha domain. So, um, so there was some speculation back then that, you know, the IDSs were really the progenitors of, of the TPSs, but there's, there'd been no real direct observation of, of, of this in, in nature that, that was really com compelling. Um, but uh, having these terpene synthases from animals and some of the initial structural models that we have, it's, it's quite clear that, you know, that these TPSs are essentially IDSs that have undergone a recent and very dramatic um, evolutionary transformation from primary metabolic enzymes into more specialized uh, secondary metabolic enzymes, TPSs. And this is what we want to sort out, um, how this might have happened through um, analyzing sequences, structural models, you know, empirical structures, um, and some of the chemical mechanisms that, that, that they impinge upon, and uh, consider the different routes, whether there's a direct transition from an IDS to a cyclic a TPS type enzyme, Maybe there's some intermediates that uh, make both TPS and I, they have TPS and IDS-like functions. Um, there could be a, a linear, you know, there could be a, a farnesine synthase there that, that is along the way of this evolutionary path from IDS to a cyclic TPS that we see. Um, a lot of questions here to, to ask and, and, and quite a canvas to, uh, to, to ask these questions. 
Um, so really excited about uh, this, this, this grant, uh, this, this project uh, that we're kicking off that Dorothea is leading um, that's, I think, captured quite nicely in this, this overview where, um, where we're looking at uh, um, the natural genes, the gene discovery um, that, that Dorothea um, is doing, um, examining the structures that, um, that are encoded by those genes. Um, building models of, of these epistatic networks and, and tools to try to predict them and ultimately putting those together uh, in a, a biophysical model. So, um, you know, this, this brings together Dorothea, um, Florian, Alex, and, and myself. Um, we've had a great time already just, you know, in, in our Skype sessions and so much to look forward to. Um, so I'll conclude my terpene section here uh, in just... You know, back to a few main points, I see that, uh, yeah, context matters. Um, epistatic networks have a, a pretty critical role in the emergence and the specialization of, of terpene cyclization. Um, I found that these old, old approaches, this Mendelian breeding paradigm, uh, to be quite useful to isolating these epistatic networks uh, from these experimental systems. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting to see that... Uh, uh, these networks are extensible to different protein backgrounds, but yet, you know, in some contexts, you know, we can see a drastic uh, reordering of, of, of some of these uh, functions, and, and the role of the protein background really matters the landscape. And so, um, you know, sequence space is, is cosmic, so there's no hope of covering it, but having some, uh, you know, fascinating experimental systems to, to examine this question is, is, is really going to take us some places. I'm, I'm excited about that. And so just with the last, you know, few slides, I thought I'd tell you just, you know, a little bit about what I do at SRI. Uh, I was brought there by following the chemicals, looking at the mode of action of, of these phytolexins and the metabolic models that Peter Karp has built. Um, um, so interested in met metabolism, drug mode of action. Um, but I've gotten into the, you know, uh, uh, the defense uh, space a bit in biodefense and asking questions you know, what sequences are dangerous. Um, you know, we need an advanced national capability to identify threats, um, both at the uh, computer terminal, you know, that people might be ordering or, or sequences that we find. So um, I've led projects uh, at IARPA to examine uh, and identify threat, threatening sequences uh, through building machine learning tools, uh, host systems models, and experimental platforms uh, to characterize the impact of of sequences on, on various uh, cell, cell models um, and derive some threat index from that so that uh, we have a, a, you know, some, some bit you know, of, an, uh, of an ability to anticipate a threat. And you know, the one thing that I, I learned through this work on the fundamental science level is actually these disordered regions, these short linear interaction motifs are found that viruses use to mimic the host. So the regions of the protein that it, we were a nuisance to me as a crystallographer that I, I would cut off, I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't have density in, in my models. You know, they turn out to be very important for um, uh, functions and in, in, in orchestrating cellular complexes. Had a really uh, great chat with Justin earlier. Um, and another IARPA project that, uh, that I had led dealt with um, detecting gene edits in environmental samples, and we developed some, some technologies to do that. Um, Folks are, are concerned about environmental releases naturally, and so we got to be able to detect them, find a needle in the haystack, basically. And finally, I just came back from uh, Arlington. Um, I lead a, a team uh, for the uh, DARPA MBA program, uh, building devices to measure, uh, you know, indicators of human performance, which, you know, um, relate to biochemistry that I know uh, pretty well, but you know, some device technology that's a key part of that. So that's, that's awfully exciting. Um, and so finally, I, just, I would just end uh, and, and just thank uh, uh, particularly the folks that I've, I've worked with, you know, over the years in, in the terpene work that I shared. And I'm really excited about uh, launching our new NSF project here uh, at Virginia Tech. So uh, with that, thank you. taking us on the journey of, of terpene synthase evolution. Um, we have time for a few questions. 
Yes. Um, I'm just curious about your last few slides. On what is, what is, uh, how is the uh, threat in SQL defined? Uh, good question. In fact, you need, you need a bunch of experts in that area to, to kind of vote, you know? Because, you know, yeah, seriously, I mean, some things are obviously dangerous, you know. Um, you know, if you go to Wiki and you look up anthrax, you'll see, you know, kill, you know, deadly or what have you. People agree on that. There's some things that, you know, are, that are a little gray and, you know, it comes, it comes down to what experts think constitutes a threat. So there's a human element to that. Um, but also there's threats that w one might infer from, uh, you know, computational models and the like. Um, it's, that's a very tough question, and it's actually not easy to define, actually. Um. Do you have any indication that the substrates themselves, without the protein, have any structure that's located in them? Secondary uh, structure? Yeah. Um, well, I think in solution, um, yeah, I think they would likely be more compact Probably, I would think. Um, this would come down to the hy hydration. Um, what about in the gas phase? Um, the gas phase, hmm. You know, I'm not really sure. I mean, I've, I've done a bit, of, you know, I showed a little bit of gas phase work, but um, in this, th that was for the carbocation intermediate. So I'm not sure if anybody's examined that. Um, but I would think they would have quite a number of degrees of freedom, even in solution. Um, but it'd certainly be interesting to look at the energetics associated with that because there's quite a, a large fold space, I think, that's accessible. Uh, I had a quick question about um, the terpene synthesis in the cell. Do, do, what do you usually specialize on one terpene? Because what I saw in a lot of those graphs was they mostly looked like one is predominant or two is just 90%. Hmm. Well, I think with the second part, you touched on uh, an important aspect of how these uh, enzymes evolve. There's often du many duplication events, and it, you might have a specialist function where you know you have an important ecological interaction that you you need to maintain, you know, like attracting a pollinator, for example, um, which you can't afford to to lose that. Um, but if you have a duplication event, then that copy can drift, and you know maybe with fortuitous mutations, you can develop another activity that, if it's beneficial in some way, uh, might be acted upon by natural selection and, and reinforced, and, and you might have another specialist TPS. So some plants, um, I think, have multiple specialist enzymes in them, um, as well as some TPSs that, that are more generalist. Those may represent different you know, stages along a continuum that, you know, sort of the, the, the snapshot of evolution that we see as we sequence things. Um. Also, unrelated, is IDC already running that threat detection platform? Yeah, well, sure. <laughs> sure, yeah. Yeah, ab absolutely. In fact, yeah, there's, there's diligence, you know, um, there's certainly diligence in, in looking at, you know, sequence orders. That's, that's been around and you know, of course, yeah, that, that needs, you know, continual updating, you know, with the latest technologies and machine learning and such. So, yeah, I mean, if you type in, some, you know, if you copy and paste in, you know, buy, you know, any toxin, I mean, you know, try to order the sequence for it. Yeah, you'd, you'd have to answer a question or two, I think. <laughs> I did, as a matter of fact. Um, in fact, we designed some libraries where we used uh, some graph theory to identify, you know, pick out high centrality residues, whether they're betweenness, closeness, or degree. Um, and those, those extended well outside the active site. In fact, we screened a library, a BFS library, um, with these outer tier substitutions because a lot of them were distributed. And we found some interesting mutations that um, other, other uh, backgrounds that suppress cyclization from mutating outer tier residues. Now we didn't go through the process of deconvoluting those to find if there was one mutation in particular, 
but we found variants where there are several mutations and they're all you know quite distant and they would be they, they could suppress cyclization so yeah we have done a little bit of that last well maybe two questions but yeah go ahead yeah yeah so you briefly mentioned the protein synthesis in microbes as opposed mm -hmm. to plants and insects I would, um, I would, yeah, well, certainly, yeah, certainly it's an area of, of investigation that, yeah, um, I, to me, I think would indicate they're, they're just as diverse, probably more diverse than plants, and I think that would be based on the short generation time that a bacteria has, I mean, 20 minutes, you know, for some of them, so the capacity to rapidly evolve, you know, a new function. I would think that they would have canvassed the space pretty pretty thoroughly compared to plants. I don't know that anyone's really compared the diversity that you know plants have versus microbes. I've been more plant centric. But you uh, don't know many protein synthases in, uh, in bacteria. Yeah, absolutely, um, and they tend to have a, a simpler alpha domain like structure. Um, the plants have an extra and terminal domain. That's one key difference there. Okay, I'll take last question. Um, I've experimented with that a little bit, actually, um, and uh, yeah, there's certainly, um, you know, you, yeah, I, I've certainly found some coupling um, between residues in using, you know, more global-based approaches, and that, um, you know, that would take multiple sequence alignments that are rather large and give you sort of an average over, you know, a family, but I think, you know, we... You know, some of the work that I've done here with Alex more recently, we've, we've you know, taken a, a much higher resolution view of that and, and, and addressed it sort of more of the biophysical coupling, um, you know, in, in addition to just the evolutionary coupling, which I think, you know, the bottom line is that these microevolutionary events are pretty important. Um, you know, when you take an, an average view of a family, some of the, some of the signal gets lost and you know, the particular context of when cyclization emerged in this plant or that, I mean, you know, nature may have arrived at the solution, the same solution differently depending on, on where it was at the time, if that, if that makes sense. <laughs> All right. Um, so, no further questions. I think we move, need to move on for, to lunch. So let's thank uh, Paul again. <laughs> still have maybe four additional slots for students for lunch if you want to participate please just you know go over to the boardroom thank you so much this was great yeah, yeah. Well, thanks yeah, yeah. yeah. glad you enjoyed that nice yeah. journey to, yeah. 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 i needed the break there for 10 minutes to put that together yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been i don't know what you, what you can do i'm in just 10 minutes, teasing right? i'm just teasing yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Putting out the picture on a stink bug or something, right? Yeah, well, I, I had to put a stink bug in there. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally, I thought I was going to come down to history and philosophy of science. Okay, wow, well, please. I think I can have experience. I'm going to fly back and make it. Yeah, Monday, I'm just doing again. I'm from 11 to 12, so I can't talk to you. Yes, you're all too nice. Maybe it's I know she has to present tomorrow for your other stuff, but she will present what she has. Yeah, but she's very well busy, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, she will. Yeah. And, and, and sport, I mean, so yeah. I can probably come after class, class, so I don't make it so much. That's a good thing. Because when you're resting in lunch, you're way up to it. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Then I just come in that time. Yeah. I just bring my. It's just, it's just, it's just yeah. only 11 to 15 to 12. So well, thanks. Yeah. And we'll be well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, I really appreciate that. I, mean, it's, I think it's kind of a complex topic in some ways, and it's been a struggle for me you know, to try to simplify it in some way. Oh, you mean that 3D? Um, but there's some simple messages I want to write with.